Yeah, thanks, Olivia. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, having me here today uh, speak, to speak to you in Poland. I'm coming from South Louisiana, and I'm sorry, but I was told to prepare a 50-minute speech, so I hope it's not too long. Uh, the, the question put before us by this conference is whether or not we should adapt to this new world or fight it. I have been asked to talk about the future of Christianity. Let me say plainly here at the beginning that Christians of the West have no choice but to fight it, and fight it as hard as we can. We really are in an existential crisis. But how should we fight? This is the key question, because the enemy we face today is unlike anything since Christ first appeared. Let me explain what I mean. We live in a post-Christian civilization. What do I mean by this? I mean that in the West, the Christian story is no longer the story by which we understand who we are as a people and what we are supposed to do. In fact, we are not only in a post-Christian culture, but in what the American intellectual Philip Reeve called an anti-culture. Reeve said that all cultures must define themselves by what they forbid. Today, though, Western culture has only one unquestionable prohibition. We are forbidden to forbid. That is not strictly true. Woke culture, that is to say the culture of the militant secular left, has strong prohibitions. I think it is more precise to say that we are, in general, forbidden to proclaim that there are any things that absolutely bind our desires. We are forbidden to say that there is a sacred order to which we owe our obedience. Christianity says otherwise, and this is why Christianity is in decline. We also know that institutions will collapse when people no longer think them to be necessary. This is why the church is in decline all over the West. Well, I strongly believe that Christianity is true and the church is necessary. This, however, is an increasingly unpopular opinion today. Because it is an unpopular opinion, the way we fight for that truth is going to have to be ingenious. My last two books have been about how to live out the faith in a post-Christian and increasingly anti-Christian world. And my next book will be on the same theme, with a focus on recovering a strong sense of God's presence in our everyday life. I want to share with you today the insights I have gained from my research. In the first half of my talk today, I'm going to speak about the Benedict Option. And in the second half, I will talk about my more recent book called Live Not By Lies in English. Well, several years ago, I published a book called The Benedict Option. So what is the Benedict Option? I take the concept from the work of the contemporary Scottish philosopher Alistair MacIntyre. In his 1981 book, After Virtue, MacIntyre said that the Enlightenment project of building a coherent society with reason alone had failed. In the absence of traditions that bind us to transcendence and to each other, our civilization had become a new version of the biblical Tower of Babel. As in the biblical story, out of pride and ambition, we built a magnificent edifice without God, and we are now forced to live in a state of mutual incomprehension, of chaos, fragmentation, and even dissolution is inevitable. Now, I should say here that this is my characterization of McIntyre's thesis. Though he later became a Catholic, he was a Marxist at this time. But the philosopher ended his book by comparing our own time to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the West. A turning point, he said, came when men and women of goodwill turned away from the task of supporting the dying structure of empire. Instead, they constructed new forms of community within which morality and civility could survive the coming dark ages. This time, however, the barbarians are not waiting beyond the frontiers, McIntyre wrote. They have already been governing us for quite some time, and our lack of consciousness of this constitutes part of our predicament. We are waiting not for a Godot, but for another doubtless very different St. Benedict, he wrote. So why Benedict? Benedict of Nursia was a Christian Roman born four years after the final Roman emperor in the West had abdicated. 
Around the year 500, his parents sent him down from the mountains to the city of Rome to finish his studies. Benedict was so shocked and dismayed by the chaos and the decadence of post-imperial Rome that he retreated to a cave in the countryside. There he lived, prayed, and fasted, seeking the will of God. When he emerged, Benedict became an abbot. In time, he wrote what we now call the Rule of St. Benedict, a small guide for living in the monastery. To God. Order is not simply a matter of law and its enforcement. In the classical Christian view, the law itself depends on a deeper conception of order, the idea of the way that ultimate reality is constructed. Now, this order may be unseen, but it is believed and internalized by those living within a community that professes it. The point of life for individual persons, for the church, and for the state is to pursue harmony with that transcendent eternal order. This means learning to live not as technological tyrants ruling over the natural world, but living within limits as the last three popes have taught us that we have to do. Third, the Benedictine model gives us stability. The great monastic innovation of St. Benedict was to demand that his monks make a vow of stability. This meant for the rest of their lives, they were bound to live in that particular monastery where they took their vows, no matter what. For Benedict, who, who wrote his rule in a world where order had broken down, real spiritual growth could not occur without roots. In the rule, Benedict said that the worst kind of monk is the gyrovague, 
who travels from monastery to monastery, taking what he can, then moving on as a sort of spiritual tourist. Well, the 21st century is built for Geirvegs. The Polish sociologist Zygmunt Bauman said that we are living in what he called liquid modernity, a condition in which there are no certainties except rapid change. The one who is best adapted to success in liquid modernity, said Bauman, is someone who has no commitments. One who can, as we say in English, go with the flow. In one sense, he is right. This is how capitalism, individualism, and hedonism conditions us. But we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to thrive? For a Christian, thriving does not mean achieving wealth, status, pleasure, or personal success, though God might give us all of those things. True thriving requires us to be united to Christ and through him in love and solidarity with others. Liquid modernity is like the great flood of the Bible. Christians who stand where they are, not leaving the comfort of our houses to escape the rising water, they will drown. But those Christians who know that they are going to survive spiritually this catastrophic flood, they will have to build and climb aboard small arcs, like Noah's Ark. If they ha they, those people have a chance to survive. The Benedict Option is a call for building arcs. Well, this is offensive to the ears of many Christians today. They cannot bear to recognize our defeat. They can still see the structures of Christianity around us, churches, Christian schools, hospitals, and other institutions, and they comfort themselves with the belief that everything is fine. They think, yeah, the church is suffering some problems at the moment, but this too shall pass. Well, I'm sorry, I think they're lying to themselves. Maybe they do so because they are afraid of the future. Maybe they do so because they are desperate to believe that they will not have to give up their middle-class comfort to stay faithful to Christ. Maybe the possibility of being thrown out of respectable society is too painful to contemplate. Well, these conformists who, who think that Christians who embrace the Benedict option are fanatics. But I remind them of the words of St. Paul to the Romans. St. Paul said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I remind them of the even more blunt words of our Lord. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for the sake of me will find it. Pope Francis has called on Catholics to go to the peripheries with the message of salvation. Well, no Christian can be against evangelizing, but we Christians cannot give the world what we do not have. I don't know what the situation is like in Poland, but here in the United States, knowledge of the Christian faith among Christians, especially those under the age of 40, is very thin. We Christians must always evangelize, but it is more important today that we tell ourselves the story of Christ and how to live it out in a fresh way. Jesus speaks of a paradox that all Christians in every generation must live out, how to be in the world but not of the world. If we are too much conformed to this world, then we will be assimilated into it, and the gospel has no transformative power, either in our own lives or the lives of the world. But if we are too separate from the world, then we deprive the world of that transformative power by keeping it to ourselves. Love is the only gift that grows by giving it away. The greatest love of all, the love of God through Jesus Christ, is shown by those who radically obey the Lord. It seems to me that the church is healthiest when it lives in the space between those two poles, between withdrawal and engagement. Christians are saved from the world so that we can be bearers of salvation to the world. We should look to the, uh, as an example, uh, from the Bible of the Hebrew slaves in Babylon. They knew that they were in exile. They knew that Babylon was not their home. But they also knew that God allowed them to become captives for a purpose. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God told them to settle down in Babylon and to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in exile. But this was not a command to assimilate to Babylon. As we see in the book of Daniel, three Hebrew slaves, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were the king's servants, refused his order to worship an idol. They chose the possibility of dying as martyrs 
before apostasy. So what's the lesson for us Christians today? We have to live as the Hebrew exiles did in Babylon, engaged in the life of our city and working for its peace and prosperity, but also separate enough that we build within ourselves, our families, and our communities the inner strength to refuse to bow down before idols, no matter what it costs. This will not be easy. We are living through a time of purification. If we will survive as a church, we will have to surrender certain things that have become precious to us. We have to surrender bourgeois respectability. The ancient Romans hated the early Christians because they correctly saw that Christianity opposed their social order. It is the same with us today. And more, we will be denounced even by many in the church who are embarrassed by the hard teachings of the gospel and how these teachings conflict with the spirit of the times. We have to surrender the idea that the church still has power. We may be tempted to believe that because there still exist Christian universities, Christian hospitals, and churches on the town square. But we do not live in a society that is influenced significantly by the church. In Poland, you do, thanks be to God, but I'm afraid this is not going to last. In fact, many, even most of these Christian institutions are hollow. We should not have false confidence. When I was in Poland researching my last book, I heard from many serious young Polish Catholics that within a decade, the Catholic Church will collapse in your country and Poland will look like Ireland. I found this so difficult to understand as an American who grew up in the era of John Paul II, but I heard it so many times that I thought this must be true. Well, when I went to the Teniets Abbey, I spoke to an older Benedictine and asked him, could this possibly be true? Yes, he said, it is. He said that the bishops have been content to believe that everything was fine with the church. But in the meantime, Western consumer culture with its hedonism and individualism have invaded the hearts and minds of young people. Well, this means that we Christians have to surrender the idea that we can survive as Christians by half measures. Many church-going Christians here in America believe that we're not in a crisis because they see the church as being more of a cultural and social institution as opposed to the means of salvation. Even if they are sincere believers, they do not understand the power of the anti-church and fail to protect themselves and their children against its seductive malice. We have to surrender the goal of saving our societies. We want to do that, but that can't be our primary goal. In America, many Christians want to believe that we will save our, ourselves and solve the crisis by electing the right politicians. These believers are looking for a political solution to a cultural crisis. And cultural crises, all cultural crises, are at bottom religious crises. They're mistaken. As the professor said in the previous session, there can be no Christian politics without Christian culture. Culture is primary. That is the thing that I focus on. St. Benedict did not attempt to save Rome or to make Rome great again, but because he put serving God in particular communities first, he built not only a kind of refuge from Rome's collapse, but laid the foundation for a new social order. In our case, if Poland, if France, and other Western nations are to be saved, it will be from the seeds of faith, hope, and love that we plant in Benedict Option small communities. Again, I'm not saying politics is unimportant. Politics is very important, if only to protect the liberties of the church and other institutions to proclaim the gospel and to teach our children. But politics is not enough. Finally, we have to surrender the idea that there is no hope. Despair is a temptation for Christians like me, I confess. <clears throat> Every day brings news of a further collapse. It is far too easy to say that the world is going to hell and just to give up on it. But we do not have the right as Christians to live in despair. For the Christian, hope is not mere optimism. No, hope is a conviction that suffering and death has meaning if we unite it to the Lord. For as St. Paul said in his letter to the Romans, we know that God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is why it is so important to study the lives of the saints, especially the martyrs, even the martyrs of our own day, like your father, Jerzy Papawushko. Our fate is not determined in advance. 
Yes, there are immense challenges in front of us, but God gives us the power to choose the good and to choose it over and over again, no matter what it costs. We must never forget, however, that the gospel is good news. No man who has truly heard the gospel remains miserable and afraid. The most powerful testimony to our faith is not the words that come out of our mouths, but the language of our lives. So that's the message of the Benedict Option. But the more recent book I've written is called Live Not By Lies in English, and it was published a short time ago in Polish. It is also a book about fighting for the faith in this time of crisis. But Live Not By Lies is a more urgent book. The Benedict Option is a book for Christians who see the faith dissolving in liquid modernity. Live Not By Lies is a book for Christians who see the faith under harsh attack from the forces of what I call soft totalitarianism. Only four years separates these two books, but in that short time, the persecution of Christians in the West has become a much greater possibility. We see this so clearly here in America, and I hope it doesn't come to Poland, but everything that starts in Poland eventually comes to, uh, starts in America may eventually come to Poland. A few years back here in America, I began hearing from people who had emigrated to my country from the former Soviet bloc nations to escape communism. They were telling me that the things they saw happening in woke America, that is, an America driven by left-wing identity politics, reminded them of what they escaped. Well, this sounded crazy to me at first. How can you compare life in America to life in a communist totalitarian system? But the more I talked to them about it, the more I realized that these immigrants were seeing things that the rest of us could not. So what were they seeing? They were seeing people in America being afraid to say what they really think for fear of losing their jobs or having their reputations destroyed by a mob. They were seeing books effectively banned for violating ideological rules that seemed to arise out of nowhere. They were seeing the news and entertainment media turning more and more into propaganda for woke ideology. They were seeing insane things like the claim that women can have penises suddenly becoming truths that you cannot question or you will lose your job. All of these things were an ordinary part of life in the totalitarian countries from which these people came. But we Americans and other Western people don't recognize wokeness and cancel culture as totalitarian because our concept of totalitarianism requires an all-powerful state that enforces its will through inflicting pain and terror. We don't have today one-party government, we don't have gulags, secret police, lines for food, the Red Army, and other things that many of us remember from the Cold War. So how can this be totalitarianism? Well, I wrote Live Not By Lies to explain why these immigrants are correct to identify this as a softer form of totalitarianism. And I also wrote Live Not By Lies to pass on to Western readers advice from those who stayed behind and lived as dissidents advice on how we can live truthfully and courageously under this new form of totalitarianism. In the English-speaking countries, soft totalitarianism is more advanced than it is in continental Europe, and especially in the countries of Central Europe. But make no mistake, as I said earlier, what happens in America rarely stays in America. It is coming to Poland, and Polish Christians must prepare themselves to resist it. Before we go further into the discussion, let's define our terms. What is totalitarianism? Well, in general, an authoritarian society is one in which political power is monopolized by a single party or a politician. A totalitarian society is an authoritarian society in which every aspect of life is politicized. In an authoritarian society, the ruling powers want your obedience. But in a totalitarian society, the ruling powers want your soul. I know I don't really have to explain this to the Polish people. You have this experience directly with, with uh, communism. Well, but we are living through this soft totalitarianism. It's soft because it is enforced not by brutal policing and the harsh treatment of dissidents, not yet, but through gentler methods. And it is also soft because this ideology claims to be motivated by compassion for official victims. This ideology is totalitarian, though, because it tolerates no dissent, because it manipulates language to redefine reality, and because it is constantly expanding into new areas of life. 
For example, this past summer, a popular American program for pre-kindergarten children featured an animated segment in which a drag queen sang a marching song about so-called rainbow families, uh, transgender families, polyamorous families, etc. An American maker of breakfast cereal, breakfast cereal, produced a special LGBT Pride Month cereal for children and on the box encouraged children to create their own pronouns. Now, I know from experience that people in Central Europe find this hard to believe. This sort of thing would have been unthinkable only five years ago here in America, but now it is a normal part of our life. In the same way, since the George Floyd killing last year, activists have forced racial consciousness into many parts of American life. Most major American corporations and even the U.S. military have actively embraced what they call anti-racism, an Orwellian term that describes a racist ideology that discriminates against people of European heritage. Now, a unique aspect of soft totalitarianism is, to this point, it does not primarily come from the state. Rather, it has conquered nearly every major institution in American life. It started at universities, it spread to the news and entertainment media, and it is now in control of big business, law, medicine, sports, NGOs, many churches, and even the U.S. military. Wokeness has parasitically taken them over from within. We still have the appearance of a liberal democratic society, but we grow less free and less democratic by the day. And uh, American and Western European companies are bringing this to Poland as a form of cultural imperialism. When I was in Poland interviewing people for my book, I spoke with Poles who work for the Polish branches of American multinational corporations. They said that even though they're Catholic, and they have, but they have no problem working with LGBT colleagues, but they don't want to be forced to celebrate Pride Month. But the, their companies are forcing them to do it. Um, and they're very worried about this. I said, please ask your Polish politicians to pass a law protecting you from this sort of thing uh, while you still can. Here in America, it is unthinkable that they would pass a law to protect Christians and our, with our consciences. You still have this power in Poland. Well, we should not be surprised that a form of totalitarianism is emerging now. In her 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, the political philosopher Hannah Arendt studied both Nazism and communism in an attempt to understand the conditions from which they had emerged in Germany and Russia. She found that pre-totalitarian societies had a number of characteristics in common, factors that led people in those countries to embrace totalitarianism as a solution to the crisis. The most important factor is mass loneliness and social atomization. Another factor was loss of faith in institutions and hierarchies. And a third factor was a desire to transgress, to destroy just for the sake of destroying. And a fourth one was the widespread willingness to believe propaganda, that is to accept untrue things that satisfy what one wishes to believe. Well, there are more, but these should set off alarm bells among the people in this room today because all of these things are strongly present in our Western liberal democracies. Totalitarian ideologies appeal to people who are lonely, afraid, and searching for meaning, purpose, and solidarity. They serve as a political pseudo-religion for people who no longer believe in God. In fact, Christians have to understand that with wokeness, we are facing a hostile religion. As our societies in the West continue to fragment and fall apart, I believe that woke elites in charge of institutions will use surveillance technology to institute a version of China's social credit system to control us. If you dissent from gender ideology, anti-racist ideology, and all the other woke dogmas, you will be pu pushed to the margins of social and economic life. And in the worst case scenario, you will no longer be able to buy or sell things. My friends, this is not a fantasy. China is rapidly approaching this condition today. Unless we in the West can muster the political will to stop it, a social credit system is coming for us tomorrow. So what can we do about it? Well, I hope I don't need to tell you that we all have to fight very hard against wokeness and its attempt to destroy our liberties. So far, though, at least in my country, we appear to be losing. And also in the European Union, you can see what they're doing to Poland and what they're doing to Hungary. Remember, wokeness has already captured 
conquest elites. They are the ones who hold power and who exercise it. And, but even as we fight them, we have to prepare for the possibility that we will lose. Now, this is where the experiences of dissidents who lived under Soviet-style hard totalitarianism can be helpful to us. I interviewed Christian dissidents living in Russia, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. I asked them what advice they could give us for living in truth, especially as Christians under totalitarianism. I'll share some of them very briefly here. First, the dissidents told me that we must prefer nothing to the truth. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian dissident, told his followers to live not by lies. He explained that the entire Soviet system was based on lies. Nobody was brave enough to stand in Red Square and shout out what they really believed, said Solzhenitsyn, but we at least can refuse to say things that we do not believe. The Czech dissident and political prisoner Václav Havel said the same thing. According to Havel, a person who lives only for his own comfort and survival and who is will willing to live by lies to protect himself is a demoralized person. Havel wrote, quote, the system depends on this demoralization. It was true under communism and it is true under this system we are building today. To stand up for the truth is to refuse demoralization and to reclaim our moral responsibility and our moral agency. Second, we have to cultivate cultural memory. That is, we have to commit ourselves to living out our traditions, to telling the stories of our culture, and to learning our own history, not allowing leftists to teach it to us, their version of it in schools or on Netflix. The soft totalitarians are trying to make us ashamed of our ancestors, ashamed of our religion, ashamed of our history, and ashamed of our culture. If they cut us off from it, we will be easier to control. We must not let them do this. We fight back by telling each other our stories. When the Nazis invaded Poland, they planned to destroy the religion of the Poles and to destroy the Polish people's sense of themselves as a nation. To fight this, a young actor named Karol Wojtyla and his friends in the theater wrote plays based on Catholic and patriotic themes. They performed these plays in underground theaters. If the Nazis had discovered these theaters, they would have shot the actors and shot the audiences. The future Pope and Saint risked his life to keep the memories of Polish religion and culture alive. Though we are not facing the extermination of our faith at the hands of Nazis or communists, those who wish to destroy our faith today operate with much softer and more subtle methods. The kind of resistance that young Wojtyla and his actors mounted against the Nazis is even more relevant today than it was in the 1940s. Third, we must form small groups of the faithful. In Bratislava, a Catholic historian who was an underground church activist during the communist dictatorship told me that it was only within his small group of faithful young Catholic men, all fighting for Jesus Christ in the underground church, that he felt free. Only with those men did he feel free, because everything outside their fellowship was controlled by the regime. Similarly, a man in Russia named Viktor Popkov told me that he discovered Jesus Christ within the fellowship of a young group of Moscow Christians in the early 1970s. The priests were too afraid to talk to him, but not this small group of young believers. What Popkov could not find in the formal church, he found with these believers. He told me that to have a living connection to Christ, it's like falling in love. You suddenly feel something that you haven't felt before, and you're ready to do something that you've never done before. This godless modern world cannot offer lasting happiness. By simply living out the faith in community, we can be a sign of hope to the lost youth of today. Finally, and most importantly, we must rediscover the value of suffering. We must learn once again the stories of the martyrs and confessors, especially the ones of our own time, of whom you have many in Poland. Suffering, suffering is at the core of our resistance. This new, this new totalitarianism is a totalitarianism of comfort. It depends for, our, for its control on our unwillingness to suffer. And there is only one true way forward, my friends, through the cross. An elderly Russian Baptist pastor told me, quote, without being willing to suffer and even die for Christ, it's just hypocrisy. It's just a search for comfort. This man, Pastor Yuri Sipko, went on to say, when I meet with brothers in faith, especially young people, I ask them, 
Name three values as Christians that you're ready to die for. Now, this is where you see the border between those who are serious about their faith and those who are not, he said. He added this. You need to confess Jesus and worship him in such a way that people can see that this world is a lie. Now, this is hard, but this is what reveals man as an image of God. This approach to suffering is what characterizes Christian hope, which is not the same thing as optimism. An optimist thinks things will always get better, but that's just not true. A Christian who has hope wishes for things to get better, but if things don't get better, he knows through faith that if he unites his suffering to Christ, that God can use it for the redemption of the world. Cardinal Robert Sara has said that hope is the virtue that makes us smile even when we stand alone against all the world. I dedicate Live Not By Lies to the memory of Father Tomislav Kolakovic, a charismatic priest who had this kind of hope and taught it to the young people who flocked to him in a time of great crisis. He was a Croatian Jesuit who, in 1943, was doing underground work against the Nazis in Zagreb. When news reached him that the Germans were coming to arrest him, the priest fled to Slovakia, his mother's homeland, and took a job teaching in the Catholic University in Bratislava. When he arrived, he told his students, the good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the Soviets are going to be ruling this country when it's over. The first thing the communists will do, he said, is to persecute the church. He knew that the clericalism and the passivity of Slovak Catholicism would not be able to stand up to communist attacks. He told his students that only a total life commitment to Christ would enable them to withstand the coming trial. This commitment needed to be concrete and it needed to be in community. Father Kolakovic began putting together small groups of young Catholics who came together for prayer and study, but also to learn how to work secretly and to withstand interrogation. They formed a network of these small groups all over Slovakia. Now the Slovak bishops warned Father Kolakovic to quit scaring people. But Father Kolakovic kept working because he knew better than the bishops what was coming. Well, in 1946, the Slovak government deported Father Kolakovic. In 1948, the communists seized power. Within several years, almost all of the priest followers had been imprisoned, and the Czech Catholic Church was brutalized into submission. But when Father Kolakovic's disciples emerged from prison in the 1960s, they began to do as their spiritual father had taught them. They built the underground church. My friends, I firmly believe that we are in a Kolakovich moment in the West today. I don't know when the worst of the persecution will begin, but I am certain that it is coming. We have to use the liberty that we have now and the gift of time that God has given us to prepare ourselves. Let's create small groups to come together for prayer, study, and planning. A great Polish hero of the resistance, Sofia Romaszewska, told me when I interviewed her that the most important thing for us to do now is to form these small groups. And let's establish networks of solidarity that cross confessional lines and national borders. We Americans need you Poles. You Poles need us. We all, all of us faithful Christians need each other. Let's commit to living lives of more intense prayer and discipleship because the soft bourgeois Christianity that so many of us are living today will not be able to withstand what is coming. Do you think that I'm being alarmist? Maybe I am. I, I hope you're right. I hope it won't get as bad as that. But consider Solzhenitsyn's warning to the West not to succumb to a failure of the imagination. Solzhenitsyn wrote that there is always this fallacious belief. It would not be the same here. Here, such things that happened in Russia are impossible. Alas, he said, all the evil of the 20th century is possible everywhere on Earth, even in America, even in Europe, and even in Catholic Poland. Solzhenitsyn called the Russian people to be courageous. In his final words to them in the Live Not By Lies letter he sent, Solzhenitsyn told them that the more of them who come together to resist the dictatorship of lies, the shorter the journey to freedom would be. If we become thousands, he wrote, they will not be able to cope with it, they being the communists. If we grow to tens of thousands, we will not recognize our country. Well, this could be our future too, my Christian brothers and sisters, even in America, even in Europe, and even in Poland. We can change our countries through Christ. The choice is ours. 
Our rebellion against this false order begins by saying no to the dictatorship of relativism and no to the evil empire of lies. So where does that leave us? To sum up, adapt or fight? We have no choice but to fight. But the nature of the war in front of us requires us to adopt particular tactics. Unlike under communism in Poland, the church is at a great disadvantage today. The people back then did not want communism. Today, the, the young people especially seem to want what the post-Christian world gives them. This is a materialist lie, but a far more pleasing materialist lie than the one the communist offered. Politics has to be part of the resistance for sure, but we can't place too much hope in political Christianity. The most important avenue of attack from the anti-Christian culture comes through the internet and social media. Unless the state is going to ban that, we're going to have to find another way to fight. The enemy this time is not an alien ideology imposed by an outside power, but something that modern people have been trained to desire and invite into their lives. I propose St. Benedict and Father Kolakovic as our generals leading this battle. From St. Benedict, we learn the value of building strong countercultural communities within which to live the gospel. We learn the value of spiritual discipline, of education, of liturgy, and religious professions. We learn how to give people what they cannot find in this post-Christian world, stability, love, and meaning. From Father Kolakovic, we learn the importance of building small resistance cells and networks of resistance cells. We learn the value of understanding the totalitarian nature of the enemy and of not listening to those who say, oh, it can't happen here. We learn the value of embracing suffering for Christ. We learn the necessity of building resilient structures within which we can live the truth when the persecution comes. And we learn the importance of preserving cultural memory as a bulwark for resistance. Will we win? Only God does. But we have to try. As Gandalf said to Frodo, no man wishes to live in times like these, but we must do our best with the challenges we have been given. Again, those Christians who live a peaceful life will not make it through the coming. Only those who love the Lord Jesus Christ more than they love their own lives who are prepared not for the battle we wish we had, but for the actual battle in front of us. Only they will survive, and not only survive, but with the help of God, triumph. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, speech. I truly recommend uh, all our audience your uh, books, Benedict Option and To Live Not By Lies. I think that even if a Polish reader won't accept all the conclusions uh, from your books, they are a very great booster for thinking about our future. If I am right, we have a time left only for uh, one question. Uh, so uh, if you let me, I will ask you about your perspective on the crime of uh, murdering unborn children across uh, the world. You speak about soft totalitarianism, and it is soft indeed, but only for us who have been born. But for the unborn children, this totalitarianism is not soft. This is bloody, I, I would say. And so all across the world, in every country, they are killed, I think, millions of unborn children. So what is your perspective of uh, our... Um, our thinking and our uh, and, and our chances in, uh, against this totalitarianism uh, uh, in, in line with, with this crime of abortion. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. The, <clears throat> the good news is here in America, thanks to the long dedication of the pro-life movement, we are getting closer to banning abortion or at least restricting it uh, significantly. But one of the, the great gifts that the pro-life movement uh, brought to, to this fight is the creation of private uh, clinics to help women who are pregnant and want to, uh, are thinking of having an abortion. These new clinics uh, give them another alternative and promise to support them if they choose life. Uh, this is uh, something so necessary uh, for the pro-life movement because it gave practical help to women who do still have the freedom to choose abortion, but the, the Christian churches gave them a reason not to. So it showed that the fight against abortion is not only something that happens politically and in the courts, but it's something that happens in the culture. We have to build a culture of life that uh, helps people 
helps these women to choose life. Um, I, I think that if we have in the U.S. the overturning of the Roe versus Wade uh, decision, which legalized abortion, we're closer than ever to overturning it, thank God. But that only means in my country that the, the right to regulate abortion goes back to the states. We have to still continue to give these poor women hope and help. And um, another good thing is science has helped us very much to advance the pro-life cause because it has been able to show uh, through the, um, the uh, scans that they do of, uh, of the pregnant woman's belly that there is a child, a human being in there. That has turned a lot of young people to the pro-life cause. I think that this is a wonderful thing, but we, we can never give up our, um, our vigilance to keep fighting for the, the lives of the unborn. And, uh, and we have to educate our own young to realize that uh, how important this is. As the, the professor was saying earlier, all of Christianity is not about abortion, but abortion is so central because if we as Christians cannot defend the right to innocent life, what is left? Thank you. We are completely short of time, I think, and so thank you for your words of hope. And, uh, and again, I recommend your books to our audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, God bless Poland. I hope to see you all there next year. Naszym gościem był Rod Dreyer, amerykański pisarz. Our guest was Rod Dreyer, author. I represented uh, PCH24 Portal. Thank you for your attention. Ja, szanowni Państwo, proszę, żebyście nie oddawali jeszcze urządzeń translacyjnych, ponieważ teraz po panelu profesora Chodakiewicza kolejny panel będzie również anglojęzyczny.